You know, it's been such a long time since we've met together to study this doctor. I'm going to have to do a li just a little bit of review. Um, so let me just remind you what we've been looking at with regard to the Holy Spirit and his nature. Remember, we've seen that uh, the Spirit of God is, in a particular way, characterized by love, uh, not just you know, uh, a warm, fuzzy feeling, but uh, rather love for something specific, and that is, of course, a love for holiness, a love for everything that God stands for, a love for his law, which should always make us um, a bit skeptical when we hear somebody say, I love the Lord, but I hate his law. If they say something like that, hopefully they're saying it in ignorance, but there are people who say that. Uh, we need to be, um, well, we need to try to help them, of course, if we can. But the Spirit of God will produce in our hearts a desire for the things that he loves. And that, not the least of which, of course, is perfect righteousness. So we looked at, um, again, the Spirit of God being the love of God. And then we looked at the different things that he does uh, in our lives in relationship to that particular characteristic. For instance, in regeneration, the Holy Spirit creates that love in our souls. He makes us to love God. He makes us to love Jesus Christ. Uh, those things that we may have known about before but didn't love, he changes our hearts so that we will. In sanctification, he causes that love to grow stronger so that we become more like Jesus. I mean, what's the difference between uh, Jesus and ourselves, well, we have sin, he didn't, but he also has, uh, well, the spirit of God above measure. And with the, uh, the fullness, as it were, of that, um, uh, the spirit dwelling in him, it um, created a, a perfect love in his humanity. So the work of the spirit of God in us is to make us love things more that our Lord loves, and in, in doing so, we become more like him. Uh, realizing, again, that our hearts, whatever they're in love with, that's what they're going to go after. And so if he creates this love for the Lord and strengthens that, then we're going to go after the things that he loves, the same things. Uh, we saw that in calling, he gives to us a desire or a love for a particular work. So in a certain sense, the Spirit of God creates love in our hearts for something that he wants us to do. Uh, in, in guiding, of course, he, he guides us in the same way, draws out our hearts in a particular direction to do a particular thing. We saw that in equipping us, he gives us gifts by which we might serve the Lord. And that's, of course, how we show our love for him and um, how we can also minister and show our love to one another. So he gives us gifts by which we might be able to love. And by the way, he also guides us by those same gifts because how you're gifted will certainly have a bearing on what direction you go. As a matter of fact, we're going to see that. We, we saw that in connection with the spiritual gifts, the service gifts, not the charismatic gifts that we were talking about last Lord's Day evening, but the continuing service gifts. Uh, those things will shape you know, a particular direction we're going to go. But what we're going to look at this evening, as far as how the Lord has gifted us with natural gifts, is also going to, in a large measure, guide the direction we go. Now, again, we've already gone through all this, so I'm just moving quickly to try to bring us back up to speed. In empowering us to do the will of God, such as when the apostles were gathered together and the disciples, and they had just been arrested and released, and they prayed that God might grant them boldness, and the place where they were was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. That boldness was basically love for the Lord. He strengthened that love. So empowering, giving us zeal, really has to do with strengthening the affection that is in our hearts or that love. And then last time we were together, we looked at the fact that the Spirit of God also teaches us what the Word of God says. And the way in which he does that is he, not by communicating information you don't open up the Bible and, the, and suddenly you hear this audible voice saying, this is what this means, this is what this means, and so forth. But rather, the Spirit of God gives to us a sense of the divine nature of the Word of God and shows us something of the glory of the Word of God. And in other words, our hearts then go out to it. It focuses our mind on it. And so it gives to us a, a better ability to study. I mean, when you're studying for a particular class, listening to lectures, reading a book or something like that, if your heart isn't in it, 
it's going to be hard to focus. But if you really love what you're doing, if you really desire what it is you learn, you're learning, you'll, you'll be focused and you'll just soak it in. Well, that's what the Spirit of God does for us as he helps us by way of illumination. Uh, he gives us a love for the Word of God, and that helps us learn it, helps us focus on it. So again, that's what we've seen so far regarding the person of the Holy Spirit and regarding his work. And if this is what he is doing in us, and I hope you would agree with me that, that all these things we've looked at are good things. We want to be careful to preserve what the Spirit of God is doing so that we don't quench the Spirit, we don't grieve the Spirit, <clears throat> but rather uh, we strengthen the work of the Spirit of God, that we are filled with the Spirit of God, as Paul commands us in Ephesians 5.18 so that we can walk by the Spirit of God or walk in this love for holiness. And that way we will go the right direction. Okay, so that's a quick review of what we've looked at so far. Uh, what I want to do this evening was look at another way in which the Spirit of God uh, grants gifts or perhaps we could look at it more as wisdom uh, because even skill in scripture. I mean, whatever a person has comes from the Lord. And skill sometimes is represented as wisdom. It's another way in which the Spirit of God teaches, um, we might say. And this, not only believers, but even unbelievers. And what I'd like to look at uh, this evening would be what we might call natural gifts, because I do believe the Spirit of God is the author of those things as well. Uh, giving to us, let's say, uh, knowledge and skill to do a particular thing, and in doing so, perhaps at a certain level, although not in the same sense, that he gives to us ability and skill in spiritual things or a love for those things, he can still create a desire in us to do particular things depending upon how he has gifted us naturally. So anyway, I wanted to call this base, uh, the, the spirit giving wisdom. Now, we've seen that he can teach he bears witness to the truth. He leads in the truth. He is the anointing that teaches us all things. He gives us a love for the truth. But he also appears in Scripture to teach in other areas as well. And I think we need to recognize that what, whatever he has given us the ability to do is something that we should see as a gift from God and something we should seek to use for the glory of God. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at this evening. I uh, actually have a number of verses. I want to try to get lay the groundwork for this quickly and so we can get to the applicational point. Uh, but so I'm, I may be assigning some verses. If, um, but let me just break ground on a couple of, of uh, passages that identify the Spirit of God as the one who actually gives wisdom. Okay? And, and wisdom can, can mean a number of things, but certainly it's the ability to, to do certain things that perhaps one can do that somebody else can't do. Uh, first of all, Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 2. Again, I'll, let me just read the first couple of passages, then I'll assign some passages. But Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 2, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God uh, who would anoint him. Uh, the way he's described here, I think, helps us to understand this a little bit more. First of all, it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. By the way, I don't want to say that all the spirit of God does is simply teach wisdom and understanding. He does much more than that, but at least he is the one who does that. Now, again, applying this to somebody else, we have an example in Daniel 5, verses 11 and 12, the example or the, the instance where Daniel has been in Babylon for a while. He served as a statesman. Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, and Daniel was able to interpret that dream. Daniel actually lived through several of these kings. Well, one of the kings decided he was going to have a party, and he, he brought all the... Uh, uh, the holy vessels that they had taken from the temple of God, and they brought it into the, into the party, and they started drinking out of these holy vessels. Uh, a hand appears and begins to write on the wall without an arm or a body attached to it, and it writes something on the wall that nobody can understand. Well, as they're looking around for somebody who could possibly interpret it, somebody remembers Daniel, and he says this, There is a man in your kingdom 
in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanations of, or explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. So again, who is it that gives this wisdom? It's the Spirit of God. And we see that, of course, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see that in Daniel as well. But we need to realize, again, that whatever wisdom, whatever understanding, whatever ability the Lord has, has given to anyone, it's basically come uh, in this way. Okay, uh, let me just give you a couple more verses, and then I'm going to assign some. Uh, the Lord said to Job, this would be toward the end of the book, after uh, the counselors come and they're not able to cheer him up, they're not able to make their charges stick against him as to why the Lord is afflicting him. The Lord says to Job, who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? And then Elihu in one of, his, one of the uh, cycles of, uh, of indictments against Job writes this, I thought, this is, he, he speaks last because he thought the elders should go first. He goes, I thought age should speak. And increased years should teach wisdom. But it is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. And he goes on to talk about even the age may not have as much understanding as the youth if the spirit of God is in that individual. So again, the spirit, in looking at the work of the Holy Spirit, the spirit is the one who gives gifts. He gives understanding. He gives ability. Uh, he is given to everyone who has ever existed, every ability that they have. And we're going to look at some of those more common ones. Uh, perhaps um, if somebody could uh, volunteer to look up Genesis chapter 4 and read verses 19 through 22. Okay, Donna. Then I need a volunteer for Exodus 31 verses 1 through 6. Sarah. Then I need a volunteer for Exodus 35, verses 34 through 35. Okay, Rebecca. Um, somebody would like to take Isaiah 28, verses 23 through 29. Okay, well, Ty, why don't we give that to Margaret? And then, Ty, would you mind taking 1 Kings 3, 11 through 14? Again, we'll see, we'll see how we do with these and see how much, how much time... 45 minutes goes by quickly when you're doing this. It's amazing. Okay. So first of all, Genesis chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. And as you read these texts, try to, to figure out what it is that uh, the Lord has, has given uh, these individuals we're reading about the ability to do. Okay. So where do all the abilities to do the things that people can do come from? All right. Who had Genesis 4? Was, Don, was that you? Now, the thing is that these are not things that they just discovered on their own. It's like God gives somebody ordinary intelligence and they just happen to stumble on these things. The Lord is the one who actually put these particular gifts down these particular lines. Not, let me ask you this question. Is, can, can, I imagine everybody can melt metal if they knew how to do it. But to forge something that, that is, um, you know, let's say worth having <laughs> uh, requires a little bit of of skill, doesn't it? And it's not something you just sort of, well, uh, that you can do unless, how do I want to say, unless you're gifted, you know, to do it. I mean, some things you can learn, but some things people just have an innate ability to do. We call it a talent, we call it a skill, a gift, you know, that type of thing. And certainly that applies to music, doesn't it? 
Summer? Well, in a case like this, I mean, we're looking at the descendants of Cain, and so we're, we are seeing that God is giving even to Cain and his line good gifts. And, and we we'll want to ask the question just a little bit, why does the Lord give gifts like that to the unconverted person? But uh, if, if the Bible is making a distinction like this, the only thing I could assume is that the other people uh, in the godly line were not living in tents. Maybe they were building houses instead. I mean, Noah did build an ark, so they had the ability to work with wood. So perhaps this is like a nomadic tribe. Okay, the next passage is um, Exodus 31. Okay, Exodus 31, verses 1 through 6. And so what do we see the Lord giving here? Um, so, okay. By the way, he did a good job with those names. I forgot to give you a heads up on that. <laughs> it's Exodus 31, verses 1 through 6. I have filled him with the spirit of wisdom. I've given him this ability. And then at the end it says here... Um, and say, Behold, I myself have appointed with him, so forth, and in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill. I don't, I don't believe the Lord is referring just to his people. I mean, a person can't have skill apart from the Lord giving skill. So when we ask the question, why is it that some people are able to do the things they're able to do? It's because God has given them the ability to do that. Now, not only that, but in the next passage, Exodus 35 34 through 35. Rebecca, was that yours? Could you read that, please? Oh, uh, hold on just one second, honey. Was, did, did you start in verse 34? If so, I might have, I might have skipped ahead one because I wanted the verse before that too. Holyab, <laughs> okay. Right. Okay, now, in, in the first part of that, okay, what, what did he also give them the ability to do? Besides being able to work skillfully with all these materials, what else could they do? They could teach. They could teach others how to do it. I mean, the Lord initially has to give somebody the ability to do something, but he's also apparently giving them the ability to teach other people to do the same thing. And sometimes skill can be reduced down to, um, you know, particular motions, particular set of, uh, you know, procedures that by which you do something, and you can learn those things, and yet there are some people who can just do it. So there's the ability to do it, there's this gift, and there's the ability to teach other people to do it as well. And those things all come from the Lord. They come from the Spirit of God. Now, let's see, I thought this next one would be a good one for, um, actually, for the, the Dozels. <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah 28. Who, who, who's that? Okay, Margaret, could you read it? Isaiah 28, verses 23 through 29. I see you've, you've got an old version there. Um, oops. 
Okay, uh, you don't have access to a more modern version there, do you? Because the one, there's one word in there that, that's missing. <laughs> you need to get an application that will allow you to... Okay, this is Isaiah 28, verses 23 through 29. Were you going to read that, Margaret? Yeah, just, just go ahead and begin at the beginning. So it would be Isaiah 28, 23 through 29. Okay. Thank you. Now, what is it that the Lord is giving the ability to do here? Just in, in one word. I mean, you, what, what's he doing? Okay. Farm, right? I mean, he, he, he gives the wisdom on how to treat each of these different things in the way it needs to be treated so it doesn't get destroyed. So it says, this also comes from the Lord of hosts who has made his counsel wonderful and his wisdom great. God is the one who gives the wisdom even to farm. Did I assign any more verses? Okay, uh, Ty, did you, you have 1 Kings 3, 11 through 14? Okay. Now, who is the Lord speaking to here? Solomon. Okay, and what is the Lord giving Solomon the ability to do? Okay. That's right. And uh, what was the reason why he gave Solomon those abilities? What ultimately is Solomon going to do with this? He's going to be king, but to... Um, why does he need to um, understand justice? A king does what? He rules and he, he administers justice. Okay, so God gives the ability also to administer justice. Now, I'm just going to uh, kind of move ahead a little bit more quickly here so we can get to some of the applications to this. Let me just point out that he also gives Joshua the ability to lead Deuteronomy 34, 9, Now Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. He gives the ability to lead. Uh, he gives the ability to administrate, 
Remember when the uh, disciples were actually the apostles were overseeing the, um, uh, the, the widows and so forth in the daily administration of the food and, and it was taking them away from prayer and the word of God. So they said, uh, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. The spirit of God gives the ability to administrate. Okay. Now, again, I think we could deduce from this that the spirit of God gives to each person whatever abilities they have. As a matter of fact, does he give wisdom, does the Spirit of God give wisdom only to human beings? Can you think of anything else that he may give wisdom to? And somebody might say the angels, but I'm not thinking about the angels in this case. Are there any other of God's creatures that he gives wisdom to that do things just innately because he's given them the ability to do that? To the animals, yeah. I mean, the animals, uh, we... Yeah, people call it instinct, you know, they just do this instinctively and so forth, but it's because God has given them the wisdom to do that. As a matter of fact, Solomon even uh, points his, his children or, you know, more largely the people of Israel, since he's been given this incredible wisdom, he points them to an animal in particular to go and learn a lesson from. The ant, the ant yes. Go to the ant, O slugger. Observe her ways and be wise. Which having no chief officer or ruler, by the way, what that means is nobody standing over them to make them work, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. So the Lord has given ants this ability to be industrious, even though they don't have somebody standing over them telling them they need to be industrious, and that way they get what they need, whereas those uh, sinful humans uh, uh, you know, uh, are lazy and we don't uh, get the work done. Okay, so all of this wisdom comes from the Lord. All of this wisdom really is, I believe, found in our Lord Jesus Christ, but he is the one, of course, who sends his Holy Spirit uh, you know, the scripture does say, and, and this may be taken a bit out of context, the spirit will take of mine and will disclose it to you. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, since the work of the spirit is to honor Jesus in everything, and since he is the logos or the wisdom of God, the spirit of God even conveys what we might call um, common grace gifts. Because all these gifts we just talked about are, are basically common grace gifts. Gifts that even an unbeliever can have. They're not gracious. They don't convey salvation. They don't give you a love for holiness, but they give you an ability to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. And I believe the Lord gives that, of course, for a variety of, um, of reasons. And for, let's see. Um, yeah, that's what we want to look at next. So let's, let's um, move from here. We still have about 15 minutes. We're going to start just a couple minutes late. And let's try to understand why it is God does this. You know, why does he give these gifts? Perhaps that would be the first question to ask. Why does God give these kinds of gifts to people, even to those who don't know him? Can anyone think of any ideas of scale? To accomplish his will. To accomplish his will. That's right. One very big reason is that the Lord has a particular plan, and he's, he's moving history forward, and, and a big part of that plan is, is revealing things and giving abilities to do things so that certain things can happen. Now, you know, the Lord has chosen not to take all those gifts and give them just to the church, right? We're not the only ones making discoveries, but um, actually a number of Christians have done that, but there's been unbelievers who have done some things too. Why do you think the Lord gives the gifts to the unbelievers as well as to the believers? <laughs> Aren't they all just walking around kind of like, oh. <laughs> okay, well, to accomplish as well. That's one, one reason. That, that is true, ultimately for the good of his children because they're going to benefit from what they're doing. What if, what if the church was the only group of people that had the gifts and ability to do things that were worthwhile and we're all prospering and so forth and the rest of the world is languishing? What, what's going to happen? What, what's that? 
Oh, that's true. Uh, they, they may not necessarily even want to be in the church. They might just come and do what to the church? A attack. Uh, one of the reasons why the Lord gives good gifts to unbelievers is so they don't attack the believer and take away what he has or destroy the believer. So the Lord does it to preserve his people. The Lord does it in order to advance history and, and even to benefit his people. Uh, the Lord does it because he's good. And he gives good gifts even to those who don't deserve them. Okay? So there's a number of reasons why he does this. Um, I do think, um, again, uh, as far as the giving of gifts and then the idea of teaching, that um, you know, the Lord may, may just sort of drop a genius into the world who gets, you know, breaks ground in a particular area, and then others come and sort of learn from that person, and they begin to teach others, and it kind of gets the, uh, the ball rolling, but uh, ultimately, what is God's goal behind absolutely everything that he is doing as, as another reason why he gives these gifts to even unconverted people, but to us as well? Okay, to bring glory to his name. Now, here's another question. When do we actually get these gifts? When does God give them to us, at least the ones that we have, of course? When, when does the Lord give us those gifts? We're talking about natural gifts now, okay? Not service gifts. We've already seen charismatic gifts have passed away, but when does he give us these natural gifts? Okay, or we might say even a little bit earlier than that, uh, okay? At conception, yes? I'm sorry, what? Conceived, okay, good. It's, it's something, you'll notice that some of these gifts actually ran in families. Uh, it could be that uh, the Lord gives that skill through the genetic code. I mean, that's possible. Giving them, as it were, this, this particular ability that we don't have. You know, at least not everybody has. So uh, at conception is certainly the case. Do you think it's possible that in, in any case he might be able to give it later? That's quite possible, too. You know, it's, spirit can come on, I mean, came on Saul and changed him into another man. I'm thinking of King Saul, not, not Saul who later becomes Paul. Um, was Saul a converted person? I think in my estimation, I don't think he was. Uh, but we may differ on that. This is King Saul. Um, anyway, uh, when Samuel appears and he says, tomorrow you're going to be with me, I don't think he's, he meant in heaven. I think he meant you were going to be in the grave with me because you're going to die. But uh, the idea is that Saul uh, was, was benefiting from the work of the Holy Spirit, giving him the ability to lead Israel, and yet his heart seemed to be contrary to God at just about every turn, which is why I don't think he was necessarily converted. So it's possible that the Lord may give certain of these gifts later and this, this ability later, but I think most often. They're given at birth. Now, how can you tell what the gifts are that God has given to you? Okay, very good. Uh, usually our areas of giftedness fall into something that we enjoy doing, and the reason why we enjoy it is because we're kind of wired that way, for one thing, plus we can do it fairly well. And when we can do something well, we like to do it. And if we can do it well and other people can see it and they tell us, that, that helps us as well. Maria, did you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, Something you're good at, something you enjoy doing because you're good at it, something that other people can see. Now, um, by the way, it's important that we understand what those gifts are because I think we should see it, uh, see those, those natural gifts in the same category as we see spiritual gifts, right? And we need to use them in order to glorify the Lord. Now, what should you do if you, um, let's say, you see somebody exercising a gift and you really like what they're able to do, but you don't have the ability to do that, so you don't have that gift, what should you do? <laughs> okay, you can thank God that somebody else has that gift and maybe it's a gift that you could 
possibly enjoy. I don't know. Okay, what else should you do? You see this gift, you'd really like it, yes? Okay, pray about it and maybe see if, if the Lord will give you the ability to do that. Possibly, that's true. Now, what if you pray and he doesn't give you the ability to do it? Okay, and with respect to what he has given you to do, what, what should we say that, that we should be? We should be content. Be content with what the Lord's given us. Annie. Can you, yes. That's fine. Okay, well, the... the no, no, that's fine. Okay, so the, the question then is, um, what, do we, what do we do if we see somebody exercising a gift and we don't have it, we ask the Lord for it, and he doesn't give it to us? Well, then, first of all, we do need to be content, okay? And then secondly, God has given you gifts. You need to use those gifts, right? Use the gifts he has given you and... Be content with those gifts. All right. Now, what should you do if you use the gift that God has given to you and let's say the Lord blesses it? Okay? You do something that's, that's praiseworthy. What should you do? Okay? Give God the glory for that. Should, okay? And, and why do you give God glory for the things that you are able to do? He's the one that gave you the ability. I mean, these are gifts, right? Um, what do you have apart from him? You don't even have existence, right? We, don't have, I mean, we wouldn't even exist. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Uh, if it were mine, maybe I could, but it's not mine. God has given it to me, so... As Paul says in another instance in Galatians 6, 14, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul was a very gifted individual, but he never took the applause, never you know, patted himself on the back. Really, the, all of Christianity, the, the, the gospel and everything is, is all geared so that we never take glory to ourselves, but we always give it to the Lord. Salvation is such that we do nothing, really, to, to contribute to it at all, nothing. We simply receive it. God does it all, and we receive it. And even the ability to receive it comes from him. So it's removed entirely any boasting on our part. That applies to service gifts he gives to us. That applies to natural gifts he gives to us. We should not be seeking applause, but rather we should be seeking to give him uh, glory and honor. Okay, uh, what do you think uh, is the case if you take a gift that God has given to you and you use it for your own glory? What do you think God thinks about that? <laughs> That's not right. And if you take glory for yourself, does, does God share his honor and glory with anyone? No, that belongs to him. That's something he's very jealous over. If somebody uh, praises you, then you need to make sure you give God glory for that and not yourself. Don't take the credit because, again, what do you have that you didn't receive?
Oh, oh okay, yes. Um, if you do things for the applause of men, I think you're, you're thinking of uh, like if you pray in public right. and so forth, then you receive your reward in full, right? God's not going to reward you for that because you're doing it to be seen of men. If you do it in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That's right. So, and that's, um, again, uh, as much as possible then that we are, when we exercise our gifts, we should not try to stand in the, in the limelight, like the Pharisees who stood on the street corners. So that's a good example. Now, let's, since the Lord has given to everyone, this, this would be the last question. Since he's given to everyone a gift, does the fact that they have that gift and they're using that gift necessarily mean that they are glorifying God with that gift? Can you think of any examples of people who have gifts who um, are not glorifying God with those gifts? Sometimes we think, you know, the people, that God has made people to do certain things, and because they're doing it, that's actually what he wants them to do. But he may have given them that gift for an entirely different reason. Can you think of any examples of that, though? Musicians, certainly. There's a, maybe, a, maybe we can put like this, this big rubric over all of that kind of thing, like sports, sports heroes and... Oh, well, okay. <laughs> well, some people do see glory in government. That's certainly true. But all these people who are, are you know, let's say um, they have certain notoriety, what do we call those kind of people? Stars, that's one term, yeah. Idols, Idols another term. Um, there, I suppose we have nicer words for it, but I mean, stars, not so bad. Or idolaters, would that be idolaters? Or? Okay, yeah. Okay, but, but stars, idols, okay, I, and people who worship them are idolaters, celebrities. Okay. I mean, a person who's prominent in government, a person who's a prominent singer, a person who's a prominent sports person, we call these people celebrities. Now, these celebrities are in the position they're in because they have certain gifts, right? But are they using their gifts to glorify God? For the most part. Not, not usually, yes, yeah, right? And, and oftentimes, even in Christian circles, they're not using their gifts to glorify God. I, I was looking, excuse me a second, I was looking at a website today, a name caught my mind, some high profile uh, pastor in Singapore, interestingly enough. And everywhere you look on any page that has to do with his ministry, there's a picture of him, you know? <laughs> and so I'm thinking, well, it's, it's his name, Ministries, and here's pictures of him all over the place. Well, who's he seeking to glorify? See, it happens even in Christian circles. Anyway, do you still remember what you wanted to say? Uh, yeah. Um, is there somebody using their gifts or using their um, gifts in a serious sense? And I know that answer is John Pinocchio when he was doing a question. Okay. Uh, how do they then give glory to God in the same way that they do in Christ? Well, um, you don't always have to necessarily vocalize it so everybody knows that that's what you're thinking. But you certainly need to in your heart, if you do anything good, to say, thank, thank the Lord for his mercy in allowing me to do that. And I know I've, I've heard you say that a number of times. And I'm, I hope that if somebody ever compliments me for something, I can say the same thing. That we don't say, oh, well, thank you. I know I'm such a great guy. I know I've done such a great job. No, <laughs> you, know, no you don't, don't do that. Um, if you do, you're taking glory away from God. You say, well, well praise the Lord. The Lord was very good. The Lord was very gracious. He enabled me to do that. He allowed me to do that. But we always need to think that in our minds and believe that in our hearts and know that that's true. And we're always thanking God if we do that. So if we do it in silence, like without voting, or if we've done something nice and you just keep it to yourself, then God's the only one who really matters to know what we've done. Well, if, if you do, yeah, if you do glow to somebody else, that is very offensive. Well, that's that's very offensive. Yeah, 
it's very offensive to God if we do that. That's right. Okay, so just because a person has a gift and they're using that gift doesn't mean that they're necessarily using it for the purpose that God gave it to them because every gift that God gives to the believer or the unbeliever is all meant to give glory to him. And if they're using it to glorify themselves, then they're not honoring God. Far from that, they're robbing God of his glory and are going to bring judgment upon themselves. So what does that say about how we ought to use the gifts that God has given to us. Should we seek applause? Should we seek the limelight? Should we seek other people to see how well we can do in all these different areas so they can praise us? Is that what we ought to be seeking? Of course not. We need to be using the gifts God has given to us to give glory to him. Again, that's why he has given us everything that he's given to us. All of our resources, all of our time, all of our talents, everything that God has given to us, he has given to us for one reason, that we might glorify him. We are his servants. By the way, can you think of any parables that address this? The parable is actually two that are parable of the talents, parable of the minas, the same, same thing. The Lord has entrusted to us certain things, and he would have us use those things for his glory. So again, the unbeliever is going to have to answer to God for his stewardship of the things that God has given to him as well as we are for the stewardship of the things that God has given to us. And if we use what we have in order to just simply, um, again, bring glory and attention to ourselves like the Pharisees did when they stood on the street corners and so forth, uh, all we're going to be doing is storing up wrath. Okay? But of course, as believers, we won't do that because we know why God has given us the gifts. We know where they come from. We know who deserves the glory for it. We know what we're supposed to be doing with these gifts. We are to be using them to draw attention to the Lord. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount as well, do your works before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Okay, let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, not you. Okay? So again, that's a temptation that every one of us has to face. We all have that temptation, but we need to give the Lord the glory for everything because he's the one that enables us to do anything good. All the bad is, is ours. You know, we can't, we're not going to credit that to him. But any good thing that comes out of our lives is solely because God has made us, God has given us a heart for him, God has given us gifts, he's given us time, talent, strength, energy, opportunity, it would be, you know, obviously it would be impossible apart from him. So we can't take glory to ourselves. All right, so again, what we're looking at here is the fact that another work of the Spirit of God is he does craft every, every creature in the world and gives to that creature the particular abilities that it has, and, and that includes us. And so we need to use those gifts to glorify God. We're talking about gifts that, that again, are not just for Christians, but gifts that could be shot through the whole human race. There have been geniuses that are unconverted geniuses, but have not used their gifts to glorify God. They're going to have to answer for that. But that's why God gave them that gift. That's why he gives us the gifts he gives to us, and we need to use them for his glory. Any uh, questions? All right, then, let's uh, close with a moment of prayer, and then let's gather in the back for...